We're hearing a lot these days about civic engagement, and civic life, and civic power. But what exactly is civics? Well, let's start finding out together. Let us now make our voices heard. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to live like a citizen. Welcome to Citizen University TV. I'm Eric Liu. This season on our show, we're going to explore the question, what is civics? Now, in this age right now of so much increased political participation, the very topic of civics is just in the air. Did you take a civics class in high school? Chances are probably not, given the way that it's declined in our public education system. But when you ask people, what do they mean by civics? What does it mean to be involved in civic life and to do civic engagement? You get a whole wide range of answers. We recently sent our crew outside the offices of Citizen University in Pioneer Square, and we asked them this question, what does civics mean to you? Let's see what some folks said. So I think uh, civics is involving yourself in your community, um, actually contributing back to society as a whole. Civics is the responsibility that we have as individuals to know what's going on in our neighborhoods, in our city, and uh, to show up and participate. Civics is really defined by the rights that you have as a citizen. As we've seen, there are a lot of different ways to define civics. Here's how we define it. Civics is the art of being a pro-social, problem-solving contributor in a self-governing community. And there are three elements to this. First, having a body of values that's about living in community. Secondly, understanding the systems that make public life work, whether government or the marketplace. And finally, command of a set of skills that enable you to organize with others and achieve common goals. Let's unpack this. Being pro-social means you're not just thinking about selfish ends in the narrowest sense. Problem solving means you're not just thinking about complaining and complaining about the problems, but being a contributor means not just simply being a spectator in civic life. And this last element here, being part of a self-governing community, this is key. This is about the work of democracy. In countries that don't have democracy, in places that are dictatorships, there is no civic life. There is no civic arena for us to participate in or claim authorship of. And so this idea and this work of embodying the values and the systems and the skills of civic life is fundamental and is a thing that we can't take for granted. Now, at the heart of all of this and at the core of this definition is this simple question. Who decides? All of civic life revolves around this question. Who decides what counts as pro-social? Who decides how we govern ourselves? Who decides how we're gonna allocate money and resource or what the rules are gonna be for who gets to belong in the community and who is excluded from the community? Who decides is at the central, central part of all the civic work. But for us in a democracy, there's another focal point here. We decide the deciders. When we vote, we elect the people, we entrust people, we delegate to them the power and the responsibility of making these decisions about what our lives in common are going to look like. And so today we want to actually focus in particular on this work of not only choosing the deciders, but what does it look like to be one of the deciders? What does it feel like to say, you know what, I'm going to raise my hand and step into the arena and I want to try to be one of these people who is going to help decide on these questions of common concern. And so what we're going to look at here is this question of running for office. Now we live in this age right now of a surge of civic engagement here in Seattle and all around the country. People are showing up in different ways. They're organizing, they're getting engaged, but people are running for office in record numbers right now. There's a doubling of the number of people running for Congress now compared to last time around. The number of people running for governor has increased dramatically. All around the United States, in offices high and low, there are thousands of new people running. Now, a lot of this is in response to the current presidential administration. And so you have women, scientists, young people stepping into the arena saying, I can't just be a complainer, I can't just be a protester, I have to try to be a decider. But it's not just people on the left, people all across the political spectrum right now are showing up. And again, not just for national office like Congress, but for local office too. Now here in our own city, in the last mayoral election, we had 21 people running for the mayor, uh, mayor's office. 21 people, and they included people who were former elected officials, uh, people who were activists and less known, people like Nikita Oliver, who, uh, where is she? Nikita Oliver, who is a poet and activist and um, attorney. 
Uh, you had folks who had served uh, as mayor before, Mike McGinn, and of course, the woman who in, ended up winning, uh, Jenny Durkin. And so you had this incredible range of people running and deciding in this moment right now that they couldn't stand on the sidelines. And in our city, it's not just the mayor's office. It's also in other offices like the school board. And so we talked recently to three members of our current school board in Seattle, and we asked them, what was it like to step into the arena? Now, two of the people we talked to had never run for office before, but all of them emphasized the importance of having been grounded in community in the first place, understanding those values, having a sense of the systems that make things work and go around, and having some skills about how you mobilize people and awaken people and speak to people. Let's hear from them about how they decided to cross that threshold and to run for office. I really respect the folks that I ran against in my race too, because all of them were first time candidates as well. My name is Zachary DeWolf, Seattle School Board, District 5. I was looking at it through the, the work that I do, which is in homelessness, and seeing that there are, are about 32, 3,300 to about 5,000 students per year who uh, are part of Seattle Public Schools that are experiencing homelessness. Um, that to me is a crisis. When my daughter started in, in Seattle Public Schools and the growth boundaries issues were going on, um, I, I got involved in those issues um, in, in the school and at the district level and started to realize, oh my gosh, there's a lot of challenges here. We don't have enough buildings. We don't have enough money. Um, education is so critical to our democracy. I'm Eden Mack and I'm a school board director in Seattle Public Schools for um, District 4. The reason why I ran for office was um, there was a lot of things that I actually tried to do and what I experienced uh, was a lot of racism. And so through that, I realized it's not as much as wanting to run for office, but actually to be heard, you know, talk to people about who I am, what I do, and my passion in terms of working with kids in my community. My name is uh, Ayomanu Betty Patu. I am a Seattle Public School Board Director for District 7. This is actually my uh, fourth term as a board director. The week before filing, um, it became known that the uh, current incumbent wasn't going to be running for school board again. Join us in fighting for full funding. Um, I realized that I'd already been dedicating such a large portion of my life to education advocacy that this was a really great opportunity. When I first decided to jump in, um, some folks from the organization Emerge Washington contacted me and let me know about their boot camp. I know there's a lot of other organizations that support candidates in learning how to run for office. Getting involved in the communities uh, is one of the biggest things you do. I was doing work for um, nine years, starting from my time in the Peace Corps, and really, really putting that um, service value into the things I was doing all the way up until I ran. And so it was, it was the marathon, it wasn't the sprint. I've had great people that donate money, but also I've had great people that actually donate their service. And that has been always my campaign. Uh, when we don't have money, we look elsewhere and find people that really care and have the passion for the work that I do. People are gonna show up to support you in whatever ways they can if they believe in you. Sometimes it's not always money. Sometimes it's, I'll take your signs out for the week and post them up, I will volunteer, do whatever I can. Knocking on doors, actually, that, I love that. I was, I was surprised at how much I lo love that because that takes a lot of time to go door to door. But that personal connection um, really does matter. Don't also wait for something to open up. Uh, if you see a need in your community, you can start to organize too. You can start to create the, the need and the conversation and the narrative by community organizing and getting folks around an issue um, and really using that as your expertise area and your kind of entree into running. And to help us explore more deeply what it actually means to run for office, we're joined today by Brianna Thomas, who's a legislative aide to city council member Lorena Gonzalez. Uh, Brianna, you yourself have run for office before. I did, Eric. In 2015, the city of Seattle moved back to the district system, and I ran in District 1 for West Seattle. There are about nine of us in the race in the primary. And this was for Seattle City Council? That's right. Okay, so there's nine of you in the primary. It's an open seat, right? It the, is. Uh, which is a somewhat rare thing to happen. And... Uh, and so when you 
what made you decide to run? Like just before you even get into the actual running, like what was that process where you decided to cross that line? Well, I um, had been a campaign manager for several years before that, worked with elected officials on all sorts of levels and on initiative campaigns. And like most people that watch instead of do, I was certain that I was going to be excellent at it. And I'd also asked several young women to run for office. And so there was some accountability for me when an opportunity showed up to actually do the thing. That's interesting. So you actually felt that because you'd asked others to run that now there was an opportunity you it's like you couldn't hide. You, you Absolutely, needed. right? Like I would have um, would have been hard to make that ask afterwards after passing up an opportunity. Ah, interesting. Okay, so so you make that decision to to go for it. Um, and you had worked in politics before, as you say, as a campaign manager, and you'd worked in Olympia um, mm -hmm. also as an aide. So you were not a total neophyte to politics, but um, still, it's first time running. What were yeah. the first things that you were you had to contend with? Uh, was it money? Was it people? Was it um, just you know certain key constituents? Like what? Were, literally, what were the first things you had to start worrying about? I think the first thing that I worried about was my family, and I wanted to call them and prepare them for what I'd seen on the outside. And you know, running for office teaches you so much about yourself. Making sure that I had that foundation to launch from was the first most important thing. Um, the second thing I had to get used to is people saying things to me on the bus. First thing in the morning, 7.15, what are you doing about potholes? <laughs> and uh, that was something I hadn't planned on. <laughs> <laughs> and w what would you say in, in these early go, you know, in, in the early going when people first started approaching you like this, um, were you just like, okay, I guess game on, and, and you just dive into talking points? It or? depended on the day. Sometimes I pled for compassion because it was 7.15 <laughs> for me, too, on the bus. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that's where folks are, and they want to talk to you. And public service is very public, and so the best you can do is say, hey, you know, that's why I'm running. I am also incredibly frustrated with the hours at the senior center and the potholes. Yeah. And so um, I, I'm, okay, so you've crossed the line. You're, mm -hmm. you're diving in here. Um, as you go, what surprised you about either how hard or how easy it was as you, as you uh, started campaigning? I think one of the bigger challenges was creating a sense of legitimacy. Hmm. Um, politics is nor has been traditionally governed by who's got the most powerful friends and the biggest bank account. And being a relative newcomer to the public at large, establishing legitimacy uh, based on my age and my gender and my experience was a lot harder than I thought it would be. People at the door would ask me, you know, do you remember 2008? Well, yes, I do. I do remember 2008. Um, another big, one of the things that was great about it, though, was how welcoming people were. I got a lot of folks that were just like, you know, I may not have been keyed in, but you look like me, you sound like me, you've got a similar background, and it's kind of exciting to have someone I really relate to that's tangible on my doorstep. So <clears throat> the first part of what you're saying, establishing legitimacy. Mm -hmm. um, so people who were, in fact, used to more, quote, unquote, traditional candidates whiter, maler than you are, right? Older. Uh, older, right? Okay, so uh, sometimes it sounds like that was unspoken, and sometimes it was people came straight out and, and said, are, are you qua even qualified for this? Is that right, are you, are you old enough to be doing this? Um, <laughs> even uh, there are some unintentional biases at candidate forums. I was the youngest person running and the only person of color, and I found myself in some situations literally with the shortest seat at the table. Hmm. Luckily, I ran with a group of candidates that were very supportive of each other while we ran, and they didn't let that stand. Hmm. So in your own work, I mean, number one, confronting that when someone just straight up questions your legitimacy yeah. in a role, which doesn't happen in most people's lives, right? right. Um, how, how did you contend with that? So you, kind of, you kept your game face on, but mm -hmm. at, at, over time in a campaign, I think this is a critical thing, right? I mean, a lot of folks watching who have never run for office, sure. maybe have been thinking about it during these times, um, that might be one of the biggest hurdles that like, it's not so much that people will say mean things about me or ask me questions on the bus, but people will question whether I even belong here, right? right. How did you get over that? I just remembered that we all have something to offer to a civic conversation. There is no one form of community. There's no one lived experience. And governing when done best and civic engagement when done best includes all of us. So I might not be a subject matter expert on wastewater treatment, but I can tell you what it's like to be a 35-year-old renter in the city of Seattle better than anybody else on this panel, and that's a legitimacy that I spoke from. Hmm, that's interesting. And so... Um that work of starting authentically from your known and lived experience, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I think probably was a source of strength initially. Uh, and then as you started thinking, okay, in a nine-way race where you've got to, you know, build a certain kind of coalition that maybe expands beyond your initial base, um, again, how did you start figuring out how to expand um, your sense of coalition there? Well, I think I, I try to, one, be responsive. There are these questionnaires that will come at you fast and furiously. Um, and it, that just From gets you thinking. From different interest groups. And, Absolutely. Yeah. You've got labor unions to folks who care about trees to educators to PTAs. Everybody has an opinion on how they'd like to see their community run, and mm -hmm. they'd like to know where you stand on that. So that really helps get you thinking and moving you in the right direction. They've got deadlines. You schedule around it. But I think the conversations that I had that pushed me a little bit outside of my boundaries, I was working, I was running from the perspective of serving workers. I hadn't thought about the fact that I needed to speak with the chamber about what my vision for workers were. Luckily, they reached out to me. And you start having that really transparent and honest conversation. Are you going to agree with everybody on everything? Absolutely not. But that doesn't mean you don't come to the table and try to find some alignment. And the more you do that, the easier it is to think about your community holistically. Hmm, interesting. So... Uh, ultimately, you were not successful in this, your first foray in elective office, but... I was not um, elected. I was successful. Okay. All right. That's actually interesting. So um, unpack that for me. Sure. Um, I think for me, one, just the learning experience about what it's like to be out there in the public eye gave me a lot of empathy for folks who are actually governing. But I currently work for a council member, Lorena Gonzalez, who I'd never met a day in my life before running for office. And although I didn't win my race, I still work in City Hall. I still get to work with her and other coalition members on creating great policy that's leading the nation. So I think there's a lot of ways that you don't win your election, but I'm still here doing what I was my desired outcome, so that feels like a win. I love that. And, you know, part of what, um, you know, going back to, Earlier in your career, when you were trying to encourage other people, especially other women, maybe women of color, to throw their hat in the ring and, and, and run for office. So, uh, you know, now we're in a time where, because of national politics, there's yeah. just this incredible wave of people who are either have decided or are thinking about running for office for the first time. Sure. Um, many of them will not have as much experience as you even had uh, prior to your first run, right? I mean, right. you had seen politics from the inside. You understood a bit what it was about. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to people who right now are watching and have been thinking about, maybe I should run for something, but I got, gosh, I know even less than Brianna did when she started. Like, what would you say to them about how they can get over that hump? I think I'd stay focused on the fact that Governing isn't just the people you see on TV. There are water and sewer commissions that need people to serve that regularly have vacancies at the local level. The county has boards and commissions that you can serve on. There's more than one way to get your hat in the ring and potentially win. And I think that we sort of um, drift our narrative to Congress and to the flashier positions, but governance happens at every level of all of our communities. And there's a place for everyone to plug in. Plus, it's nice to get a little experience before you go for a bigger seat. Yeah, and I think fundamentally for you, because you'd had a lot of experience working in community. Forget about mm -hmm. calling it politics, sure. but it was dealing with different people in different communities and constituencies and situations. Um, what you're saying to folks, uh, if they're thinking about running, is um, get that experience first, and then running will seem less like a brand new thing, right? Absolutely. People have lots of ways to get involved in their communities now, whether it's the PTA, whether it's a gardening club, whether it's doing direct services with homeless on the weekends, whether any little bit that you do to connect yourself to your community intentionally is a little bit of running. You're meeting with somebody, you're sharing an idea, you're taking collective action together, and that's something that you can build on to move forward for any position. Okay, last question for you. So, um, I think one of the greatest fears that people might have as they're contemplating this, if they're contemplating it, mm -hmm. um, is something you alluded to, which is that public service is public, that there's just nonstop uh, exposure. Um, was that a thing that um, the course of the campaign, what would you tell folks now, having lived through this, uh, um, about, you know, come on in, the water's not that cold, you know? Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat it. It's tough. There are days where you don't want anyone to ask you anything about anything. Um, really, you probably just want someone to bring you dinner. Um, <laughs> I think that what I would tell them is, you know, there's no perfect litmus test. You're not gonna get anything right on the first try, so don't let that fear be a barrier. And there's always time for a second run. So do you think about a second run? Sure, I do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Good, well, we look forward to seeing that unfold someday soon, and uh, really appreciate your joining us today. Thanks so much for having me.
My guest today has been Brianna Thomas. She's a legislative aide to city council member Lorena Gonzalez and has been a longtime Politico and uh, a one-time candidate for office soon, some point down the road, uh, a second-time candidate. We uh, look forward to hearing more about her. We've heard how challenging it can be to run for office, especially for the first time. But we've also heard how rewarding it can be because it can be an extension of work that one is already doing in the community, the building of trusted relationships and an understanding of the texture of different neighborhoods and so forth. Now, what also helps in this age is that technology is democratizing this whole process and removing barriers to entry. It used to be that you had to kind of know the right people in the right room and get their blessing in order to run. But now all kinds of new tech platforms and tools are enabling people to say, you know what, I can just raise my hand and participate and show up. One of these platforms is called Nation Builder. Let's hear from the founder of it. Today, civic engagement isn't just voting or saying yes to jury duty. The new civic engagement is running for office. Yeah, that's right. And Nation Builder happens to be a for-profit company, but they have these totally free online courses on how to run for office. And they're not alone. There are these other organizations like CandidateBootCamp.com, RunForOffice.org, RunForSomething.net, another one called She Should Run. They're sprouting up all over the place and in different local groups and community party organizations. There are trainings happening all the time for this new surge and wave of newcomers who's expressing an interest in running. And when you go to any of these sites, whether it's their free courses or otherwise, there are great detailed tools, all kinds of ways in which you can, for instance, fill out these different worksheets at Candidate Boot Camp. Am I ready to run? I'm thinking about running for this. What do I know about the office? What do I need to know? Or over here, how to run for office, literally a TikTok of, in this case, election day, what you gotta do that morning, and for things that precede election day, how you organize people, how you mobilize money, how you reach out to the right folks and think about your message and even the nuts and bolts of getting campaign signs and the rest. These tools are democratizing the work of running for office in a way that's transformative right now. Now, at the beginning when we talked about civics, we said that it consists of three elements, values, systems, and skills. And all those tools and worksheets that I was showing you a moment ago really get to the systems and the skills pieces here, the operations, the machinery and the mechanics of running for, or, uh, for office and building a campaign, the skills of knowing how to mobilize people and money and ideas and allies to do that. And that's important. But one thing that goes without saying, and in fact actually has to be at the beginning of this entire process, is this. What are your values? Are you actually clear on why you're running? For whom? To what ends? What is the moral agenda that animates you? And being able to know that in yourself, but also to articulate it with others, is so central if you're even thinking about running for office. The values piece is important in every aspect of civic life. Now, as we think about this whole ecosystem of civic life, there are, besides running for office, all these different things that we do, of course. We vote. We activate and we organize our neighbors in different ways. We think about what it means to educate people on different issues and ideas. And then we build these circles of mutual trust and obligation at the neighborhood level and on different issues. And all this work connects one to the other in building this rich and dynamic civic ecosystem. And that is the work of actually understanding and making civics real and textured and just about how we show up together every day in civic life. Throughout the rest of this season, we're gonna be talking about all these elements of civic life and what is civics. But I wanna leave you today with the central role of running for office and thinking about what it means actually to put yourself in the role of the decider, to raise your hand and say, I'm not just gonna observe or influence that question, I'm gonna insert myself right into it. That is what we've been talking about today. Well, in every episode, we love to leave time for social media questions to hear your thoughts and ideas about civic issues of the day. And so we've got a couple of great ones right now. This first one from Sue uh, on Facebook uh, uh, says, I'm fresh out of seeing Hamilton, the great musical that's out there, hip hop musical about Alexander Hamilton and the revolutionary generation. What are your most compelling takeaways from that musical civics lesson? Rise up, immigrants, we get the job done. History has its eyes on you. Those are of, co of course uh, great songs uh, from the musical uh, and they're about the activation of a generation that wants to make change, about really creating a culture of inclusion that says, hey, immigrants bring talent and they're not just here to take stuff away from the country. And this idea that there are moments, pivot points in history where we choose to show up or not. Well, for me, the most compelling takeaway from that uh, musical and from that whole soundtrack is a different song, which is called The Room Where It Happens. 
the room where it happens, this closed door room where deals get made, where the sausage gets made, all of this is about so much of the elements of politics and power that on this show, we try to throw open and democratize. We're trying to take knowledge that used to belong only to people in the room where it happens, only those insiders and cronies, and throw it open in ways that allow us, all of us, to say, you know what? I can step into that room. I can own that room and claim that room. And so that song and the musical speaks to me because that's so much of the work that we're trying to do here. The next question actually comes from Michael on Facebook, and it's a great one, a deep one, actually. How do we foster a culture of collaboration and cooperation in civic life, rather than buying into the idea that we're all competing with each other? Now, you look at this question, and you think, oh, that's so naive. Politics is all about dog-eat-dog -dog and competing. Well, yes and no. I happen to know that Michael is a teenager, and I think his generation uh, is part of a sea change that's happening in civic life right now, that it's not just about zero-sum competitions, that it's people who have been raised in a digital age that is mutual, that is connected, that is communal, saying, how can we make win-wins and positive-sum outcomes in our politics? That's what the Parkland students are doing in Florida who are organizing around gun responsibility. That's what these four Republican teenagers in Kansas are doing who are running for governor in that state. A whole new generation is coming up that gives me great hope. And so our work is to foster that young generation, add rocket fuel to their new ways of approaching politics so that they can save our culture and help us raise our sights to the better angels of our nature. Well, we hope that you'll actually keep on communicating with us, send us your ideas and your thoughts. You can reach us all these different channels and ways on social media or through our email address here at the Seattle Channel. And we hope we'll hear from you on, on these issues and others. And that wraps this episode of Citizen University TV. As we think about these broader questions of who decides and what it means to run for office, think about the deeper thing. What is civics? How do we build civic life together? We'll be spending more time on that question together in future episodes, but today, I hope you'll think about what we've learned and share it with your friends, family, and neighbors. I'm Eric Liu. Thanks for watching.